Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Williams. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a wonderful show for you today. We have a very, very important special guest, somebody that is preaching uh, a whole lot of what you've been hearing, but in a, a, a more detailed context, a more informed context, given uh, where he comes from. But anyhow, let's get busy with the program uh, right, right away. Uh, title of the show today is Martin Gurri, The Revolt of the Public, followed by Rich Screwing Us All. Look, Martin, and subtitle, Martin Gurri joins us to discuss his book, The Revolt of the, the Public. We then talk about the rich screwing us all and the shutdown to prove that is probative. Folks, Martin Gurri, author of Revolt of the Public, will discuss more than the revolt of the public. He will point out the general ills of what afflicts us in society today, that is a, a society that is really falling apart. And, you know, I mean, a lot of folks don't like to hear that bad news. Oh, is society really falling apart? Uh, actually, the, yes, society is falling apart, but you know what? It's not the end of it all. It's not the end be all at all. So we are going to get into that. And following that segment uh, with Martin, we will discuss the rich and how they are screwing us. We're going to discuss the six different ways, the six different ways. And I mean, when you think about it, it, it hurts. But the six different ways that that tax cut scam that we are all uh, that we all know about really afflicted us all. But without further ado, we have El Señor Martin Gurri. Look, Señor, thank you so kindly for being a part of the show today. How are you doing today? Well, I, I am in love with the fact that you're ruling my, the R's in my last name. Uh, you know, I, I hail from Cuba originally, so that was the way it used to be pronounced. Oh, my God. I, didn't, I actually didn't know that you came from Cuba. Uh, yeah. You know, in fact, I was over there in December. All right. I yep. had a great time. I had my black beans. I'm original from Panama, so Cuba is yep. like home, home yep. for me. Oh yeah, that's the Caribbean. Yes, you know. So uh, black beans. Anyhow, uh, uh, Mr. Gurri is all, an author now, geopolitical analyst, and a former CIA analyst. So before we even get into that, tell me about your CIA thing. Well, I was probably in the least sexy corner of CIA. I never got my double O license to kill. I was put, <laughs> I was put in uh, to do analysis of global media. Turns mm -hmm. out, turns out it was without question the most significant part of CIA to have been there in the years that that, that I, I happened to have that watch. Um, I, I mean, to give you some context to begin with. Uh, if you had even a very developed country like France or Germany, whatever the United States, the president was interested in from the media of that country, I could read in half a day. <laughs> okay. Right. I could, I could select it. I could read it. I could send it onward and they could see it. Suddenly in the nineties, things got a little hairy. First it was, everybody talks about the internet. First it was television. Uh, television started to proliferate all over the world because it became kind of a status symbol for countries to have many, many channels. And suddenly we're thinking, well, what are we watching? And then, then came the OOs, then came the digital tide, okay? And uh, I, I can't begin to tell you uh, what, what it was like to be watching this, this tsunami of information to sweep over the world and watching all the political turmoil behind it. So there was seemed to be a very direct connection with uh, between the amount of information that people had access to 
And, and the fact that, for example, uh, you had the Arab Spring, you had governments that had stood solid, dictators that had stood solid for 30 years, gone in two weeks, gone in two weeks. Um, and, and when you look at um, uh, information in terms of volume, uh, let me just take you back and pass to, to, to like from the cave paintings to say the year 2000, information grew in a very slow, stately, gradual manner. Then things went crazy. Things just went crazy. And um, the year 2002, the amount of information produced doubled that of all of previous history. The year 2003 doubled 2002. That has continued. Um, if you take that trend and chart it, you have that gigantic wave, that tsunami. Right. That chart, I hope you got as far in the book as to have seen that chart is in the book. I, I suggest that you go back to it and look at it because in that chart, everything that is happening now, all the revolts, the repudiations, they are, yep. We, let me stop you for a second. Uh, okay. we, we're, it seems that we're having sort of a feedback issue. I don't know if it's because oh. of your speakers. Can you turn down your speakers a bit? Uh, let's, let, let's see if that fixes that. Right. Uh, I mean, I got a mic, so I'm not really sure how that works. Can you hear me clearly pretty much on your side? I can hear you perfectly clearly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're, for some reason we're starting to get some uh, feedback on, on your end. This is not usually something that occurs. Okay. So let's, let, let's see if you can come back in and start talking again. Okay. Uh, I've turned down the, uh, the volume. Is that better? Excellent. Is that better? Yes. All right. So go ahead, uh, as you as you were saying, the, the 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 volume of information. Right. So where should I start from from again from the beginning or? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, you're doing fine. I mean, uh, okay. this is all live. So go ahead and uh, right. you know you're yeah. talking about all of us. So this is all live. Yeah. yeah. So um, essentially, when you look at that chart that I'm, that I'm talking about, you can you can you can see in it the revolts and the repudiations. You can see in it the, the yellow vests in France. You can see the, the Arab Spring in the Middle East. You can probably see Donald Trump in that in that chart as well, okay? Um, there, there's no way you can't look at that, that chart and not, not ask yourself, not tell yourself, how on earth can human uh, relations and institutions based on the old industrial model, which is what we are organized on, um, survive a battering from this monster? Right. I noticed there, there is a portion where you talked about the duality. There is an industrial model, and then there's that other model. I don't remember what you call that other model. Um, the, digital, the digital model. Right. How do we mitigate that? How do we, get, how, how do we merge the two? That is a really good, that you have put your finger on what is probably uh, the, the most meaningful question in not only politics, but in social life, and not only in the United States, but pretty much around the world. Um, you were talking about society falling apart. I, I actually don't think that's true. I think we're just going through a tremendous transition, a tremendous moment of transition. It, when all things pass away, it does feel like society is falling apart. Uh, I think what that tide of information did is it swept by these institutions that are, are very uh, top-down, very hierarchical, very bureaucratic, very slow-moving. And the elites that run these institutions, so we can talk about them uh, in a bit if you want, um, and has left them completely stripped of, of legitimacy and, and of authority. Because in essence, what kept those uh, institutions authoritative was the fact that for many, many years, and I'm old enough uh, to remember <laughs> this, okay? I mean, that they, my, my youthful good looks, don't, don't be fooled. Um, <laughs> that in the olden days, if you were the government, you sat on a pot of information that nobody had access to. If you were uh, a Walter Cronkite, you had CBS News behind you. Nobody else could touch that. Today, all those pots are broken, and then there's this enormous flood of non-institutional information just flowing around these, these institutions. So every mistake they make is, is out in the open and magnified. Uh, the public, which you can talk about too if you want, has gained a voice. The, the public did not used to exist. We were all part of the mass audience. We listened. Now the public, if anything, we have trouble shutting it up, right? I mean, everybody's got an opinion. So 
I think we have this conflict between a, uh, a network public, uh, a digital uh, universe, a di digital social and commercial culture. I mean, you can get a date literally at the speed of light. I can buy a car also with, with a click of the mouse. But if I want, for example, a driver's license, it takes me hours. And if I want a, um, uh, a passport, it takes me weeks. And if I want a building permit, it takes me probably years. So the conflict between the way we live and the way our government behaves, uh, I think, is tearing these institutions uh, basically at the root. That is the definition that I give of the society falling apart. Uh, I know you don't, you, you don't take homage to that. Now, um, let's start with the book. First of all, you said that the, the, the origin of the book started in 2013, 2014. Why don't you tell us why, why did you write that book? And I actually uh, have the, the, the uh, table of contents in front of me, and it's kind of present what you have relative to what's going on today. So tell me a little bit about 2013 and, and, and your, how you came about this book, and why did they jump on the book after 2016? Right. Um, I left the government, CIA, uh, and I felt, well, I had been warning about this tremendous transition that not just me, it wasn't that I wasn't like some solitary genius seeing this. There were many of us who saw this coming. But uh, again, the institutions were hard to accept that and CIA pretty much did not. So I told myself, well, put your money where your mouth is. And if you were to do analysis under this change, to explain it, um, how would you do it? And as an added incentive, I, could, I mean, I could tell that our democracy in the end is one of these institutions that is completely being battered by the tsunami. Um, our democracy is very industrial, very top down or has been, uh, and all of that is being battered away. So I did an awful lot of research, an awful lot of research and, um, came out with an ebook that was uh, e-published in 2014. Um, when 2016 came around, and it, it actually gained uh, an audience. Uh, I won't say that it was, it, it fell without a trace, it, it gained an audience. But when um, 2014 came around and uh, Mr. Trump appeared on the scene, um, everybody somehow turned over. The, the, there was just a fairly large crowd that said, oh my gosh, um, that little book of Martin Gurry's called this one. And then immediately, well, within a year, I had uh, an offer from uh, this brand new publishers in Silicon Valley, by the way, called Stripe Press, brilliant people, uh, to publish the, um, the old book, but also add a uh, updated essay, a long updated essay at the end that does include everything that happened uh, in 2016 and after. Okay, so what do you mean by, uh, what is your thesis? Okay, Baltly stated, the crisis of, uh, the revolt of the, of the public is, um, is a conflict, a, a coalition between information uh, wielded by ordinary people and power uh, represented by the elites who run all those institutions we have inherited from the industrial world. I mean, Look around. Uh, there isn't a single institution today that is not in crisis. Um, the, the elites that run them are universally distrusted when they are not despised. We can talk about Europe in this, in this regard. I mean, it's, it's amazing how things have changed over there. It's a very elitist culture. But if you turn to the US for a minute and you ask yourself, in JFK's time, in, in, in the day of John F. Kennedy, how many of the public trusted the government? And the answer was between 70 and 80%. Mm -hmm. Today is between 20 and 30%, and Congress is in the teens. So, um, and it's not just about government, all the institutions are implicated. News media. But it's, it's government the elite. Government by the, organized on the industrial model by definition has to be elite. It's a very steep pyramid between you and me and the president. There are hundreds upon hundreds of layers. And yes, so I would say it, uh, it doesn't have to be and democracy uh, uh, can flatten that pyramid. But as it's currently organized, I would say yes. Yeah. Now, um, 
when when you speak about uh, the elite taking over, why is it that we don't have trust in the elite? What is it that uh, that that's create that's creating that paradigm, if you will? Well, um, I feel like before I even tackle that, you have to kind of take the the conventional wisdom, and the conventional wisdom is what I call the economic theory of populism, mm -hmm. uh, and that one. Which, by the way, is Hillary Clinton's theory of um, of the 2016 election. Uh, she says that she won the voters who were dynamic and diverse and optimistic, and Trump won those people who were afraid that blacks and women were going to take their jobs away. Um, and, and you know, there's a kernel of truth. I mean, you, you Google if you Google. Um, globalism losers, you'll get a, a, an enormous number of uh, assertions that Trump voters were uh, primarily working class, uneducated, white, male, displaced by the tech economy, and so forth. And, and there is a kernel of truth in these generalizations. But um, Trump won booming Texas and, and, and Florida by a larger margin than, than Pennsylvania, the Rust Belt. Affluent Republicans were his basically backbone of support in the primaries and two thirds of his voters in the presidential election were above the mean in uh, income. They were better off after the economy. You look at the world, because it's not just an American thing. And in Britain, the Brexit voters were told it's gonna be a catastrophe, an economic catastrophe if you vote Brexit, they didn't care. And, and by the way, they were not disproportionately male or working class or poor. In Italy, if you want to talk populism, they have a populist government. The poor South voted for a populist party, but the rich North voted for another. And then the Northern Populist Party is like the most Trump-like party outside of Trump there is in the world. Um, in the Philippines, I don't know if you know about crazy Rodrigo Duterte. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah. Well, that election hinged on... Uh, crime and, and corruption, and not drugs, economic yeah. issues. So. It's hard for me, so I'm trying to say the economic theory of, of populism for me doesn't really hold water. Um, when you look at the revolt of the public, it's pitted amateurs against professionals in every domain and politics as well. And the insurgents have tended to be, not always, but have tended to be college educated and affluent. And when you parse their grievances, when you actually listen to what they're saying, um, two themes emerge. One is anger at the social distance. And we're talking about that, that hierarchy, that pyramid, at the social distance uh, between the public and the elites, which contradicts the democratic spirit. I, I don't know where you are physically, but if you come here to Washington, um, if you wanna go into any federal building, you have to run a gamut of guards and uh, metal detecting machines. And, um, and, and before you even enter into, um, where the government elites are actually doing their, their work. The second theme is a universal perception of failure. And I think this is a very strong, strong thing. And actually it's debatable, but I think it's a very, it's, as a perception, it's universal. Um, and it's always interpreted as corruption rather than incompetence. These are people who, uh, the government, the elites, these are people who um, basically are furthering their own interests and they pay attention to the public only now and then to give us a little lecture about you know, diversity or whatever. So I think the conflict is about these political and structural collisions rather than uh, globalization or economics. Okay, so you're, I, I think uh, you're almost sounding uh, like you, you're following some of the literature out there that calls it uh, more nativism or, and these type of issues that have nothing to do with uh, somebody's social status or well-being. I mean, you take a look at the Trump voter, uh, you either have the very poor in Appalachia or you have the very wealthy who, and you know, I understand the very wealthy, actually. If you're going to tear down uh, regulations and tear down a lot of these things, for the wealthy, that is great. So they're voting their economic interests. But you're saying that the masses who don't have those personal economies, that somehow... The, the factor is definitely not economic, and they know it. And my thing has always been, I think it is economics played in, in, in a different uh, key, if you will. But I think you're telling me that you believe economics really have very little to do with it. 
Well, I, I am an analyst, and as an analyst, I, I uh, really I, I, I shy away from saying any one cause is right. the only reason, and I shy away from saying any one cause absolutely didn't play into it. Well, of course, there's an economics element into all of this. My sense, and I always try to understand uh, the groups that I'm analyzing from the inside mm -hmm. as opposed to how they are characterized by others. That's always interesting. But what do they think of themselves? And you very rarely get a lot of economic bitching, uh, but you get a lot of why are they so high and mighty? Why you know, we've been? Do, do I exist. Why aren't you noticing that? Why do you um, pass all these rules and regulations or whatever you know, or allow immigration? It, it works both ways, by the way, because mm -hmm. there's a left populism and a right populism. The left populists all say, "Well, why are you allowing?" the corporations to run our government. And the right populists say, why are you allowing all these immigrants, all, all these people to, into our country? And you see um, a bizarre uh, unanimity between both sides, you know, the Bernie Sanders and, and the Donald Trumps uh, that um, agree only that the system has failed and the elites who have run it have, has failed. Uh, and, and, and the judgment is not a kind one, you tried and failed, the judgment is, you're corrupt and self-serving, and and honestly, in in the in the age of Harvey Weinstein, it's hard to argue otherwise. Right. Okay. Now tell me, what is the uh, phase change of 2011? Okay. Up until that moment, uh, there had been a lot of talk about how all this information, and that's basically what I have been watching at CIA, had seemed to have a lot of perturbing impact, but there had never been, for example a government that was seriously challenged by the use of these, these uh, digital tools, much less overthrown. Um, what happened in 2011 was just astounding and nobody noticed. That was the thing that drove Bill crazy. Nobody noticed. Uh, the thread between what we call the Arab Spring, which is really something that happened in very many Arab countries and in each country had a different sort of trajectory, but mm -hmm. in all of them, in all of them, the fact that the public could use uh, all these means of communication, the, what I call the information sphere, is not just the internet. Uh, it's, the it's, it's the information sphere, uh, which includes things like Al Jazeera, for example, in, in the Middle East, um, that weren't there before. Uh, it, it created a completely different environment to hold politics under. And when you have a, a the typical example of man like um, Hosni Mubarak in his 80s, uh, in a panic, turns off the internet. That his solution to the problem is switch off the internet. So he switched off, you know, he said, it, this is, I, I know how to solve this. I'm going back to the 1985 or whatever. Um, of course, it, it, it just communicated his panic. It didn't work. Um, so you had, you had what we call the Arab Spring. You had in Spain the Indignados. People may or may not remember them, but they, mm -hmm. they basically gutted the socialist government that was riding high until those demonstrations came along. Okay, um, they and and you had um, uh, the occupiers in the United States, uh, and you had in Israel. You had uh, what they call the Tent People Revolt. And Israel is a pretty interesting country because Israel actually economically was doing very, very well. So the, to me, Israel is a good laboratory example that uh, the economic theory of populism is not, it's not ex does not explain everything. Uh, and they had the tent people because they wanted cheaper uh, housing in Tel Aviv. And suddenly you had a million people on this. I mean, they, yeah. Wait a minute. Are you then, are, are you trying to uh, claim that, uh, let's say Netanyahu uh, would classify himself as a populist as well? No, 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 no. These were these, these were all anti-Netanyahu people. Okay, got it. There was there were there were enormous demonstrations against Netanyahu had just won like a year before handily a democratic election. All right, mm -hmm. but there were a million people on the streets in Israel, a country that at that time was maybe ten million people. I mean, this right. dwarfed the occupiers, uh, right. and Netanyahu was forced to backtrack and, and basically deal. Um, but all this. All these started on Facebook, 
uh, the, the Arab Spring, uh, Egypt started on Facebook, and then we could go into the, how that, that happened. Uh, the Indignados, same. Uh, the the um, occupiers, not quite entirely on Facebook, but that was very powerful. So you have this kind of capacity to self-assemble, right? All right? Uh, and one of the interesting things about the public is that it doesn't seem to have leaders. And in fact, turns on them. That's it's a lot of the um, what I call the internet culture, which is very egalitarian. And anybody right. who sets himself up uh, immediately gets taken down, right? Uh, so very few people set themselves up. There is very few people who claim to be leaders. They have no particular ideology. I mean, there's a kind of left and a right populism, but they're very squishy, both of them. Um, and um, they are, so, so their main unifying and energizing factor is that they stand against. They are just against. They want to bash at the established order and at the elites that they consider to be so utterly corrupt. Now, in bashing the establishment order, do they have a do they have a recourse thereafter? What do you mean? Uh, in other words, uh, you, you're saying that the, the I'm getting that echo again. You're saying that um, mm. at the current time, uh, what we want is just a simple set of disruption. We have all these these facets that are putting disruption out there on the table. In doing so, is there something there that they expect out of this disruption? What it, what what comes after? That. That is such a good question. Okay, um, I don't know. I have read. Do they no know? Idea. You have. You. Have, I don't think. Well, let me put it this way. Um, I have read everything. Those, those those groups that I just mentioned, and that was the phase change. And the phase change refers to I don't know. Scientifically, it means when water turns to ice. That's the moment right. when the same thing, temperature, but the phase yeah, occurs. Ch yeah. Changes into another thing. Well, that was. A political phase change when what was talked about well the internet and, and the information sphere are kind of interesting disruptive tools and suddenly no that their government's falling down and there's a million people in the streets um but you ask what is it how do you settle well for example in israel the same thing happened in spain but the government went to them and said what are your demands and it was a babble of voices they really they had no positive programs that they were espousing. They just wanted things to change and they wanted to take down uh, the system as it stood in some vague generic way. I mean, they were not violent, any of them. Now, uh, uh, so in, in effect, people want change, but they don't know what they want? Well, they don't have a programmatic approach. I think each one of those people who took this speech probably had a very strong and sincere and probably well thought out idea of what they wanted. But um, as groups, what brought them together was they were against something. Right. And, the, and the second that you say to them, okay, now let's do what you want. For example, the second that Hosni Mubarak um, left, he was the unifying force. They were all basically there, and they, they ranged from very, very lefty um, socialists to Muslim Brotherhood types that were on, on the street demonstrating. So once he left, what happened? The, the, the people that were in Tahrir Square just kind of dissipated. They broke up. They fragmented. And you find that we're living in a very fragmented. People talk about partisanship and uh, one party against another. I, I think that's that's completely wrongheaded. I think we are in, a, in an era of almost uh, the, uh, shattering of, of political identities. And the parties are very um, laboriously trying to piece enough of those little shards together, the little mosaics to come up with a picture. And I guess eventually they do, but um, you can see what happened with, with the Republicans and the Tea Party, and you can see what's happening with the Democrats and uh, their younger crop of, of uh, Congress people that have just shown up. Um, they are more divided than united in, in many different ways, except if you're a Democrat, you're against Trump. That's the unifying factor. If you can find something you're against, suddenly you can, you can put a big crowd on the street. Okay, so what is the answer in your in your in your as as you perceive it? Uh, you you said you added a, the the new portion of your book. Did you have yeah. answers there, or did you just describe the path to uh, Donald Trump? I I felt it necessary to say in a very timid and and sort of tentative way what I thought would lead us, you know, at least broadly, out of out of our 
our path. I let me explain. I'm a CIA guy. The CIA describes reality, and you toss it over to the policymakers, and they're the ones who say, "Well, now what we need to do to fix this is X, Y, and Z." And honestly, by nature, I don't feel like I'm wise enough to say, out of this enormously complex moment of turbulence that we have right now, how to do one or two or three things uh, that that are gonna completely end. Uh, the turbulence and, 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 I don't know, bring us back to happiness. But having said that, I think that pyramid that I was talking about yes. can be flattened. You need an elite. This is a modern society. It's not like we're all going to be, I mean, we can't be walked into a nuclear uh, powerhouse and say, okay, out of uh, egalitarianism, now you run it, and then somebody else, somebody else will run it tomorrow. So we need elites. We need people who know what they're doing. But the distance between the elites and the public does not have to be as great as it is. And I mean, you have no idea how terrible the federal government is as, at, at digital, anything digital. I've, I lived inside of that, okay? It's terrible, but it can be done. If you look at the little country of Estonia, they have pretty much digitized their politics and their government. So although it's not a complete solution, I would say, it's the beginning of the of the lowering of, of of the distance. I think one of the most annoying and 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 um, alienating aspects of the system of the industrial uh, system is the enormous distance between the top and the bottom. In an age when you can get that that car or that date just by doing a click, everything is flat. The other aspect of it, I think, will be a little more painful. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of it now, which is okay. We do need an elite. But my sense of, of the current elite class, I call them the industrial elites, is that they're not even interested in changing things. I'm not sure that they know how, but I'm pretty sure they don't want to. I think that distance, that great big distance, that's what being an elite is all about. That's what's cool about being an elite. That's what they want. They don't want to give it up. So my sense of it is that they are going to have to be swept out. They are going to have to be replaced. That can happen very peacefully. I do write about it in the book. It's hard to get into it uh, without getting pretty complicated, but you can, I mean, you essentially, there's a Spanish philosopher called uh, Ortega Gasset uh -huh. who talks about well, how, how are elites selected? Well, essentially you select your elites in a certain way because you pay money to see their their movies, you vote for them or, or give them money to, to run for campaigns. Um, you watch them on television, you give them your attention, you give, you, you are creating the class. And I think each one of us have got to uh, start thinking more in terms of who is it that we can give our, our attention and our support to that is less in that conflictive, um, I'm right, you're wrong, I can solve everybody's problems, which is the industrial mode of, of, of rhetoric, is I can solve problems. I mean, society isn't just a, a, a set of relations, it's a set of problems, like a mathematical thing. Um, if you have a candidate that says, let's try this, but if it goes wrong, we'll try something else. And a candidate who may say, uh, I think I was wrong about this. I'm voting for that guy, okay, or that woman, because um, what we need in our elites is humility, and what we have is the opposite. We have kind of a, a blind, a blind arrogance. Now, um, I'm going to bring up a subject that may seem anathema to this, but I don't think it is at all. Uh, specifically, um, when speaking about elites, it seemed to me like, uh, and I don't know where you stand on this that by definition, that, that vast distance between the, the elite, your quote-unquote elite, and the rest of us are caused by the, the actual uh, outcome of the economic system that we have, which is capitalism. It seems like that is baked into the system, that ever-growing that ever uh, space between those two, unless, it is, <laughs> unless there's some external force uh, regulating it, right? Either that or a change altogether. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, and I, th I think what you what you have articulated there is the left populist view, right? Um, two things I would say is, um, again, most of the people who have been leading the revolt of the public 
are people who have computers, access to Facebook, the ability to be articulate, most of them college educated, uh, uh, many of them employed. Um, so th they were not necessarily at the bottom. No, and those in that phase change moment, uh, nobody from marginalized communities participated. In Israel, for example, it's, it's uh, um, the Palestinian, the Arabs, the, the local Arabs, they did not participate. And uh, in um, in the United States, among the occupiers, there were hardly that's any what blacks. I was about to bring up. Yeah, any blacks, hardly any Hispanics. Um, so, number one, yes, there's no question that capitalism creates enormous inequalities, but that doesn't seem to have been what what these people were feeling. Uh, and number two, what's the alternative? I mean, the weird thing is, and this is what people talk about democracy being in trouble. And I go, yeah, well, I think democracy as we know it is probably in, in deep trouble and in, probably will not be as we know it anymore. But democracy itself as, as liberal democracy, representative democracy, I'm just even talking about an ideal, but mm -hmm. a process. Um, there, there are no real challengers out there. I mean, this is not the 1930s. Uh, there are no totalitarian ideologies that seem almost church-like that people flock to because there's some kind of salvation from capitalism. Well, isn't the salvation from capitalism uh, some sort of democratic socialism as we see in, let's say, the, the Scandinavian countries? Yeah, I mean, but I've been to Scandinavia, and the difference between Scandinavia and the United States is minor, okay? This is, true. Yeah, 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 true. So, so yeah. True, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, so 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 you're. I, I think if 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 we feel that uh, what's happening in Scandinavia is fairly benign and folks are or 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 fear, you know live fairly good lives, I think what you're saying is it's we are not so far away from being able to have a, a fairly egalitarian society, not in its in not in its absolute form, but one that works for everybody, assuming that we were to scale that here. And tell me where I'm wrong. Well, we have to reconcile that angry public to the system. I say, I think that's the number one thing. And that will not happen. I believe this is the judgment. I think, number one, that's an obvious thing. Mm -hmm. two, as my own judgment, that is not going to happen until we get an entirely different elite class. I Agreed. Think, and, and I think it's happening, by the way. And I think a lot of the howls of pain and a lot of the democracy is dying in darkness and all this kind of stuff, I think it's because for the people who, um, who have been essentially responsible for managing the great institutions, it's being taken away from their hands. A different mm -hmm. crowd is coming in, generational, I think, as much as anything else. Um, and it seems to them like the end of the world as they know it. And in a way, it's true for them, but it's not the end of democracy and it's not the end of the system. It is simply a very turbulent moment and it could go bad. It, it could go right or it could go bad. I, I never make predictions. We just each of us need to make sure that it goes in the right direction. Well, uh, Senor Gurri, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about how folks can learn more about your writings. I know that you, you have a blog. I also know that your book, uh, tell them how they can go ahead and get your book. Well, we have your book, the link to your book on our, on, in our blogs right now so Great. that everybody can go get your book, which is, uh, I have it, and it looks, uh, I haven't completed the book, but it's a great read. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how we can learn more from you? Well, thank you. Um, I do have a blog called The Fifth Wave, uh, which is kind of denotes that wave of uh, information that I was talking about. The book uh, you can get from Amazon and you can get from Stripe Press. And I, I will make a pitch for the hardcover version. It's not that expensive, but if you're in Amazon Prime in particular. But um, because the Stripe people have done something, and this is not me, by the way. I, I don't, I didn't, I, I'm a happy recipient of this, but I wasn't part of the planning process. They have come up with a new reason to buy a real book, which is it looks beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I mean, you remember it, it, way back in olden days, looks for aesthetic things, right? And suddenly we got into this kind of, how can we make it cheaper? How can we make it cheaper? Everybody's competing for the, the least price. Right. But I mean, the price is reasonable. I'm here to tell you. But 
I think there is a new book that is about to be born. You know, I've, I've been watching as a, somebody who's interested in information, the fact that um, ebook has flattened out. Ebook has not gone the trajectory that I would have expected it, which is eventually it overcomes and, and overthrows uh, paper books. It has not happened, it's flattened out. Now, audiobooks are very big, but I think the future for the paper book is in being an object of beauty. That's the right. new book. And so I, I urge you all who are listening and watching uh, to take a look at it. Take a look at it. You can see it in uh, uh, in Amazon, and it 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 has been decided. It's got enormous numbers of graphics and photos and whatnot because I I'm a big believer in, in visual persuasion. But the way they did it, so they're my photos and my graphics, but they did it beautiful. <laughs> so well, I I, um, I would urge you to look at that. Who better to plug the book and and you can find his um, website at the fifth wave dot wordpress dot com right. check it out the fifth wave dot wordpress dot com and uh, look uh senor gurri thank Easy you enough. so kindly for having been here with us before i let you go though anything that you might want to say that i didn't ask you please feel free no i think i got all my my story out uh I, again i would I would urge everybody who is out there to um, stand back from the shouting and look at the sources and the forces that are driving that and, um, and realize that to some extent, if it really is a revolt of the public and you are a member of the public, to some extent, you have ownership of that future. You don't have really the right to rant. You must do whatever it takes to get us over the hump to, to whatever our institutions are gonna be looking like. They will not look like they did 50 years ago, but they could be more democratic. They could be more authoritarian, authoritative. Um, it all depends on each and one of you. Senor Martin Gurri, thank you so kindly for having been here. Author, geopolitical analyst, former CIA analyst. Thank you so kindly for having been here. You have a wonderful rest of your day, my friend. Muchísimas gracias, Egberto. Tenga buen día y chao. ¿Está bien? Chao, chao. Adiós, hermano. Bien. Folks, that was Martin Gurri, uh, ex-CIA agent. And uh, right, that book, I have that book. And I, I wasn't able to complete the book. But let me tell you, folks, it's a, it, it is solid. It has a whole lot of stuff we've talked about on this show. It is an, it's an important read. It is a very important read because, you know, th there are a lot of folks out there writing books and, you know, they're just doing their thing. Uh, this one has purpose. Just like I'm writing that book that I'm going to put on the screen right now, which is, uh, what again? Uh, politics done, <laughs> how to make America utopious, just like I'm writing that one now. That's going to be of interest, folks. Uh, before I get into the rest of the show, I want to remind you that this is a this is a show that you sponsor. This is a show that you subscribe to. This is a show for you. This is a show not for the elite that uh, Senor Gurri was talking about. This is a show for you. So please go to patreon.com slash politics done right. Again, that is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics done right. Or if you just want to, uh, to subscribe, and that starts at a dollar. A, a month. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Can you buy Politics Done Right? A half of a coffee a day. I mean, a, a half of a coffee a month or a coffee a month or a donut a month. That is equivalent to what uh, uh, how you can start with Politics Done Right. So please feel free to go to patreon.com slash politics done right and be a supporter of progressive media. Be a supporter of, of a uh, the, the type of media that, you, that, that that's going to make a change. If you listen to what uh, Senor Gurri had to say, it was interesting, right? Because he said it's a revolt against the elite. It's, and the elite is the current mainstream media. The elite is the current uh, corporations that run our government. The elite are all these different folks that we're talking about. And the only way around that is for us to actually support the independent media like politics done right that's actually trying to make a difference in ensuring that you are informed and in ensuring that you get the news that you want 
If you only want to make a one-time contribution to keep this progressive media alive, you can always go to politicsdoneright.com and just click on the donate button. But please consider subscribing. That is what's going to keep us going. That is what keeps us in D.C., Portland, Washington, uh, New York, and all these places when we go for all these interviews. So please go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics done right. And you know what time it is. Let me tell you what time it is. How rich, how the rich are screwing us all. The big economic switcheroo. This is a blog that I wrote uh, late last week. And I meant to do it on Friday, but something else came up. I think it came up with uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Actually, if you go to the front page on, on um, Daily Coast, the article that I wrote on Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, really made it out. There were quite a few views on that, that thing it, you know, and created arguments and discussions. Over 500 plus messages just in a few hours. Uh, it was a solid, um, solid discussion maker. Anyhow, how the rich are screwing us all, the big economic switcheroo. The manner and number of ways Americans are screwed by the rich, the corporatocracy, the plutocracy, the oligarchy, as uh, Mr. Gurri said, the elite are immense. But the most callous exploitation is imposing debt on all which cripples us throughout our lifetime. The problem is that the theft is so ingenious, many times we don't get it. Many times we don't get that theft. It is occurring, we don't get it. Robert Reich's article explains that theft in a few short paragraphs. He said the following. Decades ago, wealthy Americans financed the federal government mainly by paying taxes. Their tax rates was far higher than what it is today. Now wealthy Americans finance the government mainly by lending it money and collecting interest payments on those loans, profiting when the rest of us pay them back. Follow the money as the debt continues to grow. Interest payments are becoming huge. Taxpayers could soon be paying more in interest on the federal debt than we spend on the military on Medicaid. Reich points out, close quote, Reich points out that most of the tax cuts that Republicans and Democrats have been providing to the rich are a form of theft. Why? I explain after his quote, and it goes as follows. Now keep following the money. One of the biggest reasons the federal debt has exploded is that tax cuts, starting with the Bush administration in 2001 and extending throughout the Trump's 2017 tax cut, have reduced government revenues by over $5 trillion. The Trump Republican tax cut will cause the debt to explode even further, Trump's own office management and budget predicts, and added $100 billion a year in deficits over the next decade, adding up to $1 trillion of additional debt. Keep following the money. Most of the benefits from those tax cuts are going to the wealthy 65% have gone to the richest fifth of Americans, 22% to the top 1%. So you see the big switcheroo, the rich used to pay higher taxes to the government. Now the government pays a rich interest on swelling the debt, caused largely by lower taxes on the rich, which means a growing portion of everyone else's taxes are now paying the rich interest on those loans instead of paying for government services everyone needs. Close quote. A few months ago, I explained the many ways in which Donald Trump's tax cut scam was screwing the poor and the middle class in the article titled How to Explain to Right-Wing Family Friend Trump Tax Cut Scam Screwed Them that everyone should read. But folks, this doesn't only apply to the President Trump's tax cut scam. It applies to much more. But here are the six ways. You know, and, and make sure... Understand these and go to the blog of the week. Go to or go to Politics and Right for this show and copy this blog down and have these six points ready for your uncle, your aunt, everybody else who that thinks Trump did well for them. And I wrote this before the, the shut the government shutdown, okay? The government shutdown and, and, and I also wrote this before the tariffs. And interesting enough, the tariffs are hurting Trump's people more than anybody else. It's hurting the farmers. We had them on TV today talking about what it's doing to them. 
And, you know, the small farmer that should get some of the supposedly support from the government that they're given the, the kickbacks to, to, to support the, the tariffs, the young small or the, the, the small farmers are not getting it. Okay? They just can't get their check. The big guys do, but they don't. But here are the six ways, the six ways that you were screwed by the tax, uh, the Trump tax cuts. Here it is. The wealthy brought, uh, brought back overseas profits at very reduced tax rates enacted in the Trump GOP tax cut scam. This means less money for the Treasury. That's numero uno. Numero dos. Overseas profits were mostly invested in stock buybacks, which increased the value of the stock price and thus the wealth of the wealthy stockholder. Potential wage hikes and investment in workers denied. Eso es número dos. Vamos al número tres. Number three. Because of the income, because the income is being realized as capital gains, the tax rate, which will be much lower than dividend income, less money for the treasury as the wealthy gets richer. So remember, those stock prices appreciated. When they sell those appreciated stocks, they don't pay the tax rates that you and I pay. They pay capital gains rate, which is less. So money that could have been gone into the treasury, nope, 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 it's gone to them. Numero cuatro. The government must borrow money to fulfill its obligation. Who buys the bonds to loan the government money? You guessed it, the wealthy. And what does that mean? We transform more of our income and wealth to the form, in the form of taxes to pay the interest on the money we borrow from them. Numero cinco, number five. The government cut programs like healthcare, food stamps, and the like to reduce the budget deficit caused by the tax cut that goes mostly to the wealthy. Any minor tax cut the middle class and poor would have seen is then is more is now gobbled up by the increase in health premiums, increased fees to parks and more. And guess what? Who profits from that? The wealthy shareholders of the same health insurance companies, hospitals, etc., that charges the public more than they charge the government. Wow, these guys just keep cleaning up. Econ and number six. Economic growth that helps the poor and middle class is stunted because in Economics 101 parlance, the marginal propensity to consume by the wealthy is much less than that of the middle class. In other words, economic activity is determined by the number of times money turns around, the velocity of money. So therefore, if you give a whole lot of money to the rich, they're not going to spend any more than they normally would have spent anyway. You give that money to the poor and the middle class, they spend it right away. It turns around in the economy. More money it turns around in the economy. It creates more demand. It creates more demand. More people get jobs. More people get, uh, they buy more from the farmer. They buy more from the baker. They buy, all these things increase. The lower classes get more money. The lower classes get wealthy. But no, nope, we don't care about that. We don't want the wealthy to get any more. Well, I mean, the poor to get any more because we need to keep our heels on their necks so that they will be kept in their place if they are kept in their place we can continue on top and be dominant as they feel the necessity to do as we tell them to do it's not just a big switcheroo folks it is grand theft country's money Folks, let me get to the website or let me get to the uh, files here and see what people are saying. But folks, we have to start taking care of ourselves. We have to start understanding what's going on. Okay. Welcome, Gary Walsh. Uh, I haven't seen you here before. Lawrence Sim, flood of misinformation as well. So sure. Daniel Ledo, Scandinavian countries do not have democratic socialism. It's a representative democracy with large welfare systems. Hmm, uh, interesting. So what? Uh, Daniel Lado, LOL, have you ever considered rather than lamenting tax cuts that perhaps the government should spend less? And you know, it's spend less, you would be in trouble, Lado. You know, you should try you should try your own medicine and see how far you get away with it. You know, a lot of the people that are always talking about spend less money. The government needs to learn how to spend less money. You know what? Most of you guys couldn't survive a government spending less money. You see, most people don't realize how much, they re how much they need the government. 
Most people don't understand how dependent they are on government until the government is no longer there. Then suddenly, they get a heart. Suddenly, they get empathy. Suddenly, they realize, oh my God, after all, I do need government. Let's go ahead and see what else we have here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Who else do we have? Who else do we have? Okay. Welcome aboard, Stuart Snow, Beatrice Small, and Lawrence Sims. I think I called Lawrence already. But anyhow, so folks, uh, please remember uh, what Mr. Uh, uh, Murray had to say earlier was some very important information, the battle of the elites. How do, we, how do we get around it? We speak about that at nauseum, you know that. And we'll continue to speak about these issues at nauseum because unless we do, unless we continue to speak out, unless we continue that message, the reality of what's occurring in our society today will redouble will triple, and the pain and the angst will continue. So rest assured that Politics Done Right intends to be here, with your support, of course, to continue revealing the message, to continue bringing you quite a few people who are, who are apt on all these issues, who have solutions, and if they don't have solutions, they can at least identify the problem. This week, we have two other guests that will be coming on, one to discuss education and one to just discuss the state of our politics in general. It's going to be fun. Tomorrow, uh, at, uh, our KPFT program, the one that, uh, that we air on 90.1 FM, <coughs> have been moved from Thursdays to Tuesdays. So uh, remember that. We <coughs> Sorry about that. Got a cold. We will be in the studio uh, on Tuesdays instead of on, on Thursdays going forward. Folks, please remember to go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics done right. Please be a part of the family. Please consider supporting us. This is how we make it. This is how progressive media, the ones that are going to tell you the truth, this is how we tell you or we inform above and beyond what's not being done on mainstream media. So please, please, please. Go ahead and go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash politics and right. It's right there below on the screen. And if you just want to do it one time, go to politicsdoneright.com. You have a wonderful day. Thank you so kindly for being here. And you know how we close out this baby. I am what? Out! <laughs> Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S that is at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four.